Hey folks, it's Harold Goldberg from the New York Video Game Critics Circle. We're here today with some special guests. We have uh, uh, George Fan, the creator of Plants vs. Zombies, and Garth Chateau, who uh, I've known for many years and was the original uh, PR rep for PopCap Games. And, and we also have our uh, awesome senior writer and uh, mentor, Ronald Gordon, here. So we're going to have uh, a, a conversation about PopCap, about plath, pants, Plants vs. Zombies, and uh, George's new game, which is really awesome uh, from what we can see. So, uh, I'm, Gartha, I, I am going to start with you. And uh, when, I, when I wrote my book, All, All Your Base Are Belong to Us, I, I, I had to include a chapter on PopCap because it, it changed the nature of, of the way games are with casual games. So could you tell me how you got involved with PopCap uh, in, in, in the beginning and, and, and what were those uh, early days and years like? Well, it's a fairly long and rambling story, but I'll try to keep it brief. I uh, met the founders of PopCap when I worked at Total Entertainment Network, which was an early online multiplayer gaming service. And that company eventually morphed into Pogo.com, which was kind of the first casual games destination on the web in the early days of the web. Uh, those founders left around the time the company transitioned to Pogo.com uh, and started up their own company called PopCap up in Seattle. Actually, originally, it was called Sexy Action Cool, but they don't really like to talk about that so much. Um, that original name was taken from a sign on the side of a bus uh, advertising an Antonio Banderas movie, and it just said Sexy Action Cool, and they thought that was so great. And they didn't expect to be a public-facing company. They were going to be kind of a middleman making games for other publishers, so they thought that would be okay. But as soon as they realized they could make and publish games their, themselves, they changed the name to PopCap, uh, they approached me around that time when the name changed and invited me to join. And I said, guys, I've just joined this other company. It's supposed to be a rocket ship. I've got equity. You've got one game, Bejeweled. I, I don't know. You know, is that really sustainable? Why don't you call me when you have your second hit? So a few months later, I realized, no, PopCap was going to be a lot more fun than where I was. So I called them up and said, okay, is the offer still open? And it was. So I joined the company in 2005. Uh, and in those days, casual games really wasn't even quite a label yet. But to the extent that it was a label, it kind of had some baggage. And the guys at PopCap didn't like that term and said, why don't we come up with something else? And I said, well, we could try that, but that's a tough road to hoe. It's very hard to establish a new category maybe we could just own the casual games category and sort of redefine it um and so that's what we set out to do uh and thankfully the company just churned out hit after hit never really had a flop uh didn't release probably three quarters of the games that they conjured up in their minds and developed to various extents they really only put out the very best of the the ideas uh which sort of helped establish a really good reputation and uh, the company thrived from there and George's games were a, a core part of that in San Aquarium uh, first and then later on Plants vs. Zombies. Well yeah and, and, and thanks for this uh, segue Garth. I, I wanted to ask one thing. I just remember that Bejeweled exploded so hugely that you had very large uh, press events including one I went to uh, in Seattle at, uh, was it the Jimi Hendrix Museum or something like that? What, what, was, what was that about? Just to, to, this is only to remind folks that, uh, of, of what goes on at uh, a big press event for a game. So uh, God, can you just talk about that one? That was one of the few big press events that we did and it was to launch Bejeweled Twist, which was a sequel to the original Bejeweled. And uh, yes, at the time that uh, venue was called the Experience Music Project, uh, but previously it had been specifically the Jimi Hendrix Museum owned and operated by Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft. 
Um, and it was a wonderful venue. So we decided to do the event there and uh, we're excited that you could join us. We had Mark Saltzman from USA Today join us and other esteemed journalists. And it was a really fun event. And uh, I think George may have been there, but if not, he certainly contributed the most uh, oh. uh, zany idea to the, the oh, whole I, I, whole I was thing. there. I was there too. So yeah, we were George, in the same George, Harold. George, George, I, I get. I guess we were. We probably even met. I, George, what was the zany idea that you uh, you contributed? I, I had the awesome idea of because it was promoting Bejewel Twist. I thought you could get Bejewel Twist literally into, you know, you can get the gameplay into the dinner event if you just you know seat everyone at tables of four around a circular table and have have everyone's meal on a lazy susan and then you'd order you know you'd order your like chicken or you'd order your fish and then and then at, at random times someone in someone on stage would go twist <laughs> and then and then everyone would rotate their their dinners by one and then you'd you know you'd you'd be eating your chicken and then you'd be eating someone else's fish uh it, you just you know a lot of variety you know, and then it, it, it exemplifies the gameplay. I think it really hammers home that you're like twisting in groups of four. I think uh, I think it was a pretty good idea. No one, no one else seemed to think so. Uh, we, we obviously, you know, I, know, I, we, I, didn't, I, we didn't do that. I, I vetoed that idea because I don't like fish. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there was fighting words. Uh, <laughs> so, so George, um, to me, uh, and, and to Ronald, I think as well. Uh, the best popcat game was Plants vs. Zombies. Uh, it, it 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 was so deep and 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 I think did, was that t uh, 2009 when that that uh, came out. I'm not sure if uh, got my uh, dates correct, but um, the the artwork was so brilliant. And here's like uh, from, from the archive. The yeah, from the archives. <laughs> it's perfect for the Halloween season. Um, how, you're you're listed as creator in, in Wikipedia. So before I hand it over to Ronald, I just wanted to know, uh, as far as history goes, how you created this idea. Where did it come from, and, and how sure. did it get going? See, so, so like a lot of ideas, it it comes from. Not not just like not just one place. It was it was kind of a like, created over the course of experimentation with with a few things. So I think we could trace it to the the very beginnings was was maybe that uh, I think for in San Aquarium. So in San Aquarium uh, was a game where you feed fish and the fish poo money. And then they grow bigger, and they poop more money, and you're and and then you can use that money to buy more fish, and it's kind of this, it's a kind of this e economy simulator in a fish tank, and and also aliens attack your fish tank. So that was in San Aquarium. Uh, I was asked to think about what what uh, in San Aquarium would look like on the DS when, so I had to think about the the two screens, and then that kind of got me thinking. Oh, I think. Uh, of ideas for an insane aquarium sequel which which uh i kind of wanted to have you know it's insane it would be in San aquarium too so you could have two fish tanks that you can that you'd alternate between and the the bottom fish tank so there'd be kind of two fish tanks stacked on top of each other and each you would you would kind of interface with by like by uh going from one fish tank to another uh you know you never see both fish tanks on screen at the same time and the bottom fish tank would would act like the insane aquarium one fish tank and the top fish tank was kind of a more uh a a, a defensive kind of game where you would uh you would buy maybe archer fish to kind of uh to kind of fend off the way and there'd be ways of aliens coming at you so so that 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 kind of got the ideas of uh, uh one place where you generate where you generate your economy, you generate money, and another place where you kind of defend against things. I was also playing. This is this is when tower defense was just kind of just kind of 
coming on the scene. Uh, I was playing a lot of them in uh, a lot of tower defense mods in Warcraft 3. Uh, Warcraft 3, uh, amongst the other things it generated, it, it you know, it gener it, there were a lot of cool uh, tower defense mods. So I was getting into those. And I had the idea of, uh, uh, oh, you could make a game where you're you're tending to your your garden, so you have to water your plants, and they would they would grow into full grown plants, and then the plants would you could you I had I had cabbage pulse as one of the things you could you could you know water into, and they would yeah the cabbage pulse would lob cabbages at at the oncoming um, waves of aliens. They were they were they were the the same alien from San Aquarium. Now there's more of them, and now instead of being hungry for fish, they're hungry for you know salads. Like that's what they're that's what they're coming for. Um, so I had the idea. I had I kind of I, I was messing around with a a uh, a tr more traditional tower defense game, and uh, where you 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 would you know there would be kind of a grid, but you could plant. You could plant anywhere on the grid. You could place your towers anywhere on the grid, and then the uh, I was actually programming uh, uh, pathfinding for the for the you know for the uh, enemies to kind of walk around the whatever maze you made for them. Um, how, yeah. So, however, there were things that I didn't like about that format of tower defense. I thought there were kind of some cheesy tactics that you could employ. One of them was um, so, like I said, that the the bad guys would go like would try to get to from the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen we'll say okay and then you could you could kind of uh plant, put your put your towers however you like but one of the cheesy things you could do was was a tactic called juggling in which you have you have the uh bad guys going towards one opening in your maze and then you would quickly block that off and then create another opening near somewhere else on the screen. And then the, the AI would kind of make the uh, bad guys go toward that opening. And then you could just keep alternating between these two and then the bad guys would never kind of get anywhere. I thought that was like, it just kind of uh, showcased that, you know, the bad guy AI wasn't all that good. Uh, um, and I, th I think I was also playing some games where uh, I was playing some tower defense games where you would summon a a a, a little a little battlement or a little castle tower, and and then there would be a little knight, this little cute little knight, kind of like standing at the bottom of your your tower. And then when the orcs came close to the knight, the knight would go up, whack the whack the orc a few times, and then when it got out of range, it would walk back to its tower. And I'm like, why? Why? Why don't you continue attacking the orc? Why do you like the, the orc is obviously a threat? Why aren't you falling? So it kind of just made the, the the narrative kind of feel weird. It's just like obviously this is a game. Uh, it, it, so I was trying to I was trying to get around those two things at once. Uh, one by kind of changing up the formula. So I thought, hmm, maybe maybe instead of creating a maze using your towers or you know on that grid maybe the, you just have a lane based system that's where i came up with the the lanes and it's it's a lot simpler in in a lot of ways and you just have whatever the enemy is just kind of walk from the right side of the screen to the left and just simply do that and uh and then at the same time i was like i i like to um i i thought oh Plants are great for a tower defense game because plants, you know, they stay in place. So, so uh, yeah, that was the evolution from from the previous game. But uh, I, I knew at that point I had a screen. You know, you know, the five lane thing. It worked. It, it actually it actually turned. You know, that was kind of an experiment, but it was it was a it, it ended up being you know it ended up being a kind of a fun way to to play tower defense and. Then I was I was thinking, okay, so one of my goals was yes, I want to keep this on one screen. I don't want to have like the 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 grid be so big that you kind of have to scroll around to see the whole grid. So my goal is to keep it on one screen, and in in the spirit of a lot of like, a lot of pop cap games too, are just you know 
pared down to like the gameplay is pared down to its essentials and it's very um accessible and uh, easy to learn and that's i think that's why um me and popcap synergized pretty well because i was also into those things so, uh, so there's so, an, yeah. e an economy of uh of going on where it's it's nothing it's not it's not too big it's just you can see it all on on one screen you don't have to really do anything else except kind of in, in plants versus zombies to defend your 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 living room basically your house yeah. um how did i guess the question i have well I have a lot but how did you go from aliens to zombies yes that's <laughs> it, it was still aliens right up to this point and it became zombies when uh, it, it was a couple things. One was mainly the gameplay reasons. Uh, when I when I condensed everything to one screen, I felt like the enemies that came towards you had to like had to be able to move very slowly so you could have enough time with that one screen to to plot and strategize and and uh, the aliens just. The, the slower I made them, the kind of more unrealistic they kind of felt. I needed an enemy that everyone that that would go slow. So it was going to be either, I, I guess, snails. You'd fight snails. I don't think I seriously right. considered that. Or what else? What else moves slow that, that everyone knows? Like shambles towards you. Yeah, braids. Yeah, Harold. There. 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 Um, yes. Zombies. Everyone knows moves slow. And part of it was kind of like it wasn't just that it was it was I I did think the the idea of you know you kind of tending to your plants to fight off zombies that was kind of an un I think tending plants to fight snails for instance it feels a little bit more mundane or just like you know snails are natural pests mm -hmm. and but I think I think it was just like make people kind of pay more attention if it was a little bit more kooky or you know not not what you would expect and uh and i just yeah i thought i thought zombies versus plants could be could be kind of something that makes people pay attention and take note i mean there, there's so much going on there because it's 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 uh like a suburban horror fantasy it's uh uh, uh you know the, the part of the uh, uh, what began as kind of a zombie trend at that point we saw so many zombie games after that um mm -hmm. and it was and 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 it was the art style as well which was um unique um so so there there was so much going on there on that one little screen ronald do you do you feel like you want to want to start uh, some questions through, uh, regarding pvz yeah yeah totally so um Hey George, hey Garth, um, hey Ronald. Ronald, as you know, uh, I have plenty of questions, uh, mainly because I've been skulking a little bit through uh, some of the other interviews you've done, uh, George, as well as scouring your uh, various social medias. So I, speaking on Plants vs. Zombies, I just want to know, uh, you said in an interview once that your favorite zombie changes throughout the years. Um, so I wanted to know which one is it uh, at this very moment. <laughs> What have I said in the past? I've liked. I think I've I know, liked the pole. Twenty nineteen, you said gargantuar as well. No, garg. I say gargantuar a lot. I think I've. I think it. it it's a toss up between gargantuar and pole vaulter usually, mm -hmm. and today because I thought of it first, I'm going to say I'm going to say the. I, I'm I'm feeling pole vaulter today. This is the first the first zombie that we put in the game it was still very it was still my my very crude pixel art version of it and it was the first time two times i just cracked up after i put the i i, I cracked up the first time i put a walnut in front of it and it jumped over my defense and i was just like this is it's just really funny the idea of a zombie with a with a pole vault um and and just that you plan your defense so well and just kind of like gets around it all. And then the second time was when I watched, I had someone play test it, and they had they were like, "What is this pole holder coming at me?" And they put a walnut in front of it, and it also hopped over that. And I was also, yeah, I was just also just like just cracking up, uh, very very amused. So I think it really 
yeah, it was really special for that reason. I think it was like the first zombie we put in that was really kind of more humorous and and it, it but not just being funny for funny sake. It was it would actually as a result of kind of actual you know gameplay like it the pole vaulter is there to kind of make your first uh first column of defense um and kind of negate that a little bit and get around that but it's funny you say that george because the very first version of the game that i played it must not have had the pole vaulter because the zombies weren't actually really animated they were like little cardboard cutouts that sort of shuffled across the screen oh yeah the the first version you probably played didn't have the pole vaulter. It had probably just, yeah, I probably just had three zombies. Oh no, four. I think I had four because I think I had the flying zombies, but they didn't, they weren't holding balloons. Rich, Rich Werner came up with the balloon idea later, but they were holding these little contraptions. Uh, kind of, I guess, kind of like drone like, I guess. There weren't drones back then, but like a hang glider. Uh, like yeah, a like it was glider. it was like a little yeah, a little propeller device that they kind of hung on to. And that was to get around, you know, they were there. That was the idea that they're they're just like aerial zombies that could get around your ground defenses. And you had to back then it you had to plant uh not cactuses, it was just this beehive plant that kind of shot bees out that would you know that would take down aerial things. Um, but what were we talking about again? Oh yeah, favorite, favorite. Yes, that that version you played also wasn't uh, the the suburban idea wasn't defined yet. So there were just uh, three zombies or three zombies each with a different like a zombie without a helmet and a zombie with a silver helmet and a zombie with a gold helmet. Mm. Um, and this is. <laughs> and, oh, oh no there there were five zombies sorry and then there was a zombie with a black helmet that was like you know with 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 angry red eyes it was just like it was just my my very very crude pixel art and kind of just these color shifts were just very quick to do at the time yet still communicated um i think everyone knows silver versus gold gold is first place silver is second place so you kind of think of uh, silver as being, you know, secondary to gold. Uh, at least that's how that's how I do uh, coins in games a lot of times. Um, I don't know if you've noticed. If I can avoid, if I can avoid bronze coins, this is like a little little George uh, in, insider tidbit. So in Santa Cram has silver coins, gold coins, and then diamonds. You get. Like the the blue tinted diamonds because that, that that makes them like a different kind of color to stand out, um, which I guess if you thought about it too much that that would actually be kind of sapphires. But I think people see blue diamonds in there also. Like that's that's fine, right? And and, uh, and plants or zombies had sun as the main resource, but once you started collecting this like meta resource, this kind of that that turned out to be silver. Silver coins, gold coin, and then diamonds as well. And the reason I exclude, what do I have against bronze? I, I mean, I don't really have it. I think it's just, I've I've seen cases where you just you just see a bronze trophy, right? And it kind of has that 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 tint that you don't you don't know if that's like the gold trophy. It kind of has that yellowish like brownish tint, right? And then you don't know if that's the gold trophy until you see it next to a gold trophy or something sometimes and so i thought oh if you have just bronze coins next to silver coins you kind of you could you could kind of get mixed up a little bit and i just i just wanted to avoid that altogether so i just start from silver always that is why george fan games start with silver if they can if they don't need the you know if, if you can get if i can get away with just three things then i always go silver coins gold coins uh diamonds and and Yes, yeah, at Garth, the version you played, it just had silver helmets and then gold helmets. And then they were kind of these medieval, uh, you know, the knight helmets with the little, uh, the little, little visor thing. Visor thing. Yeah. Well, they, it wasn't a flip down visor. They, yeah, they were kind of like the, the ones with like the back flaps. Um, I think of 
Legos. There's like a classic Lego <laughs> helmet that looks exactly like that. It's got the little little notch in the middle kind of, where, yeah. yeah, that comes down. Uh, so the zombies, we're wearing those helmets for some reason. And the, the, the urbanization of Plants for Zombies came about in two ways. One was um, my friend Tyson, who also worked at PopCap later. Um, or no, he was working at PopCap then. He suggested it should be called Lawn of the Dead, the infamous Lawn of the Dead name, which causes so much trouble because I really love that name. And I, I really wanted to call it that name um, for the longest time. And names are weird. I, I was so stuck on it being that, that nothing else was, was sounded good. Uh, and once he called it Lawn of the Dead, uh, mind you. So at that point, the game was, was a, you were planting these in your garden, remember? Uh, it was kind of like a gardening game. So it was kind of like a backyard garden with like a dirt, um, rows of like dirt patches. So the nice thing about that is the main plant in the game is a green plant, plant sh uh, pea shooter, right? Mm -hmm. And what I liked about the, the I like the contrast of the brown on against the green because uh, that makes your characters stand out more. So, so it was like, um, in going to the front lawn when you're planting a you know a different shade of green on a, on a another different shade of green and on your lawn that was the sacrifice kind of I kind of made to kind of uh, because we were calling this game Lawn of the Dead it would make no sense if the game wasn't on a lawn right and then yeah. we were able to make the grid on the lawn by by those like uh, the, the the you know the the lawn mower paths kind of like a grid of a grid of that so that that worked out really well. Um, but that is why I made the sacrifice of having the, the, the kind of the main plant stand out a little bit less. Um, so there was that and uh, an, an artist that was working at the San Francisco PopCap office, uh, Sergio, was, was gave me this, this sketch that was pretty pivotal, was like, hey, here's uh, that, 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 that conehead zombie that, that yeah. Reynolds showed. He was like, hey, you could be like, the zombies could just pick up stuff from around the neighborhood. Um, so that's when it became like a very a very urban, like or urban game, like a suburban, just like you were just like in a suburban house. Um, and I really liked that, so I went with that too. So that's when the the cones got changed out from from the silver helmets, the these medieval, medieval silver helmets, and then the buckets replace the pale you know these 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 metal pails replaced uh uh the the gold helmet which that i just re rely on people know that metal is harder than plastic right that's that's yeah i i if you'll i if you'll notice i put in a lot of these whenever i can i i i go with something that people can just instantly visually recognize as like here here is the mechanic visually like i try to do that in games whenever possible Oh, cool. So from the zombies you fight to the plants that fight them, uh, with, my next question is, of course, which is your favorite plant? Because uh, there's a lot of them, and I, I like a lot of them. My, my favorite is the uh, the icy pea shooter, that one, the frozen pea shooter. I love that yeah. one. Yeah, so, snow pea, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Love the snow pea. Uh, I, my favorite is... <clears throat> I always say I think I don't think I I waver between this one. My favorite is the squash. I love uh, the the conciseness of the name and its purpose. What it does it squashes zombies? It it um, I think I originally designed it. I, I did the original sketches of it kind of with my pixel art, and Rich really took that essence of that and kind of gave it his own personality. Like I really like. Uh, what the artist Rich Werner, um, what he, yeah, the, the kind of like grumpy, grumpy face he put on this, this real squash, angry, yeah, just tired yeah. of everything, but, yeah, yeah. So he gave it, he gave it the next level of personality, which it makes me really love the plant. Oh, cool, cool. And so, uh, my next question, um, this will be like one of the last few about. Well, it's just not because we could talk ages about this, but I, I want to know what sort of things were left on the cutting room floor that didn't make it into like any of the final games, any just sort of ideas that just didn't come to fruition. We, yeah, we, we, I know that we were working on the game for a long time, and there's a lot of content in the game, so there's 
there's we there maybe is not as much as you would expect um but yeah there was a a, a zombie a zombie that i'm kind of uh, a little bit sad we couldn't make work was uh the dog walking zombie we had a dog walking zombie who had like this bulldog who has like who also got zombified i guess but kind of like turned into a demon dog almost <laughs> somehow uh -huh. i don't know how that logic works but the original the original idea was like this is like kind of like demonic looking bulldog mm -hmm. and and the the idea was the dog would would be at a level lower than the the, the peas um so it would kind of get under those so your peas would typically hit the dog walker the dog walking zombie in the in, in kind of like back and then the, the 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 dog would kind of be off its leash and then just like charge at your plants but then we kind of had to come up with a a type of plant that could hit um maybe lower level things uh, also you could you could still take out uh, I think we were kind of like, oh, you have you're, you're reliant now on the the potato mine or like the cherry bomb to kind of take out these these dogs. And um, I kind of for I I do know we we I mean obviously we cut it, um, and obviously I I really wanted it to make it into the game, so there must have been a good reason it didn't make it in. And um, I think it was just we we already had the flying zombies and just another class of things that that you kind of had to take care of uh I, I think yeah i don't quite remember why we cut it but um i know we tried to make it work uh, and we just couldn't make that work other things that were cut uh, we cut a lot of so there was this point in making the game where uh me and todd were taught todd, todd todd semple he's the programmer on the game and he's He's like incredible, he, and he's really fast too. And he, he, um, there was a point in the making of the game where me and Todd kind of had some cycles to burn, and then we were kind of just um, waiting, waiting for the rest of the art to come in because uh, I think I think Rich also joined the project a little bit after us, so we we kind we kind of had a head start, um, and we me and Todd. We're just like, what kind of things can we do that are more uh, programming and, des and design intensive? So we came up with the, we we just had this kind, this this uh, breeding ground of uh, mini game ideas, and we just kind of we had that. As you know, there's like a kind of like a a couple of pages with grid a grid of mini games, and we were just kind of trying a bunch of wacky ideas out. Um, I think one of the more one of the more ambitious ones that didn't make the cut was I thought of this. Uh, wait, was it this? Yeah, I thought of this like you had this giant boiling pot of boiling water in the middle, and you would try to throw some stew ingredients into it. Maybe, maybe it was from some of the. I don't think it was. You were actually taking the the sentient plants in the game and putting them <laughs> in there. That would be uh, cool. Yeah. But maybe you were kind of like harvesting these potatoes and you would throw them into the stew. And then meanwhile, the zombies like are trying to climb up the edges of the pot, trying to get, get into your stew. And I just remembered like I had a sketch or something of like, instead of the zombies ate your brains, it'd be like the zombies ruin your stew because <laughs> like they get in, they, they mix in with the potatoes and then that's, you know, uh, that's it's not gross. a good stew anymore. Uh, that idea didn't didn't make the cut. Um, wow. I think yeah, I think it was a little bit too resource intensive, and the gameplay wasn't all that was wasn't all that different. So yeah, we we had a bunch of things on on that level where we were trying things out, and they just either weren't novel enough or not fun enough. Um, but we tried out a ton. I think there's like a whole page of a whole page of discarded mini game ideas. So I'd say that's where a lot of the cuts went went into. Mm. Well, it can't be a statue without cutting away a lot of the rock. So um, yeah, yeah I thought we'll get that. Uh, speaking of art, I just wanted to know before we move further into the, the main course of this, which is Hard Hat Wombat, uh, outside of like all that you've done, like what would you say is a true just like work of art? 
what's the what's the magnum opus in George Fenn's works? I think that's pretty. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to be surprised. I feel yeah. I feel like Plants vs Zombies is on my on my deathbed. That is going to be, <laughs> you know, my mag magnum opus for sure. I don't expect to make anything. I'm I'm as happy with as 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 that game. We 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 finished the game maybe two years in, and we spent maybe two and a half years in, and we spent the last year just kind of polishing it and, and adding all those extra modes. And and um, yeah, one of the things one of the things about when PopCap asked if I wanted to work on the sequel. Um, I think one of the reasons creators work on their sequel sequel games is, oh, uh, the first game kind of had had this deadline that they were trying to meet, and and it was it was kind of rushed out the door maybe a little bit, um, and they couldn't they couldn't make the perfect game. They couldn't do everything they wanted to for the first game. So like a sequel would be a chance to kind of revisit these things they wanted to do. I didn't have anything like that any desire like I, I didn't have i thought pop cap i mean i thought plants for zombies i i i had put all everything i wanted to into it um so i think for that reason too uh I, i'm just gonna say yeah i'm gonna say my answer is plants for zombies that's no to no one's surprise right um, that's fair yeah, the, yeah. What, Ronald, uh guys the wood questions i i have is uh at one point at one point uh EA bought PopCap, and then there were Plants vs. Zombies became different. So, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts of this uh, this this change in Plants vs. Zombies that that went forward? Can I tell you that when I first heard of, I was still at PopCap when I heard they were making a first person shooter, <laughs> and and my first response was, "Wait, how are you gonna?" Plants can't move. <laughs> How are you going to like? That's the whole reason I chose plants is because they obviously can't move as 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 the as the main protagonist. Like they're towers with personality that I that I can inject personality into. But I, people know they can't they can't move. So uh, that that gets around that whole remember the thing that I was complaining about with the with the with the guard around the tower, the knight that would like go after the orcs and then come back. Um, yeah, you know the plant's not going to do that. And that's why it's not going after the whatever the enemy is. Yeah. So I was pretty stunned, I guess, by by that. Uh, I I um I kind of saw Plants vs Zombies two. Um, the at least you know by the time I I left, I kind of saw what that was shaping into being. Um, the the I I wasn't I as as I, I was saying I wasn't officially on the team I did kind of I did uh, really still really um, I I was very attached to for obvious reasons the you know how the how the quality of that game was going to turn out so um, I did offer as much time as the team needed to for like I was in a lot of the earlier meetings with with the Plants vs Zombies 2 team. Um I remember I I I actually had not made a sequel but I kind of just tried to make a you know what I intuited was like the the challenges and you know what what the the challenges into making a sequel what the sequel needs to do what in and you know um I remember making a kind of I a, I guess a presentation to the team that we went over together. Um, there are a lot of like points that we hit, and you know what what are the what are the challenges in making a sequel, and what the, what 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 Plants vs Zombies two needs to needs to be. Um, and I think the yeah the main kind of uh, the main the main thing that was kind of kind of uh, the assumed of the game it was kind of forced onto the game by by popcap and the 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 um kind of the environment and the just kind of what what was what was happening in the that side of the games industry was that the game had to the game was going to come out and it was going to be free to play and you could uh you know we're going to try to uh 
make their well there yeah they were going to try to make money off of it through microtransactions and yeah ups, ways to upsell the plants and um yeah to be honest i didn't really have um they had they had other designers on the project and i just was like i trusted them to just you know i didn't really have any input on that because it's for a lot of the there are some things i can as a designer i can kind of distance myself from and kind of project and say like oh here's you know here's how a, a player in that mindset would would make it work like i feel like i can do that pretty well for um trying to understand what what would trip people up when they're learning a game or you know what they what don't like i, I think i'm able to kind of um get around maybe some assumptions that people would have like oh because um vert whereas like i don't i just can't make the leap in terms of like i don't when i when i play these kind of games i don't have any desire to purchase anything so i can't uh i can't understand what would make someone want to want to you know i i can i i understand how to make a good game and then we can sell that game to someone someone you know for for a, a set price mm -hmm. i know how to make a good experience i don't really understand you know and i i admitted that back then well i i don't know if i if i if i said it out loud but i admitted that i didn't really know how to uh, I didn't understand that 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 market or that you know how what kind of things I could design in a game to kind of George, you're being way best. too kind. You're being way <laughs> too kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We know that what you really thought was, well, this is going to suck all the fun out of it right here. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty you know, much. I mean, honest, uh, honestly, yeah. I've had uh, my issues with microtransactions from the get go, um, and and I think the only time. I did buy some. Was uh, I got very involved in a Bethesda mobile game called Blades, mm. and so I spent ten dollars on that, and, and, <laughs> and I, I felt it was worth it because uh, it was. <laughs> but but uh, I haven't, you know, with the uh, with other popular games, you know, you could super popular games. You can mention I, I I haven't I haven't indulged, but I did indulge at that one time, and I feel like I got uh, uh, a fair amount. Of uh, back from what I spent, but uh, I, I I feel like you're already putting up the money, right? You're already buying a game, yeah. <laughs> or and uh, then the, you know they they try to get you the second time, but uh, that is not the yeah. case with uh, hard hat uh, wombat. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. So what do you Ooh. have? What, let's good ask some questions, Ronald. Yes. So, well, that's good news for how I want, but not having microtransactions. Thank you so much. Um, so you bet. Now we're moving on to all yes, good and hard hat want that. And I just want to know what inspired this because I I've seen from your Twitter that you looked up so many wombat facts and it can't just be the facts on wombats that inspired this. So I, I I'd want to know. Like life plants versus zombies. It was, maybe not just one you know one flash in the pan moment kind of uh it it started way back um many years ago actually uh i i entered my my second ludum dare game jam it was it was a it's a 48 hour eight hour game jam and the theme where, where you're we're making a game around a theme and the theme they gave me for that event was 10 seconds that was the theme so um uh after i get the theme i kind of like like to run around the house <laughs> like and just like and, and then and then kind of just like brainstorm okay what can i what can i do around the theme um for whatever reason i thought of the idea of you are a construction worker that has to eat eat lunch eat a sandwich every 10 seconds or else you'll die <laughs> so <laughs> you're trying you're trying to get your you know your buildings done while finding a lunch station you know every 10 seconds and uh i thought i thought that that premise seemed kind of humorous so i said i set out you know over those 48 hours I was, I was making this game i was like okay what can construction workers do they can stack like these metal blocks um and you know stack them into different kind of structures i also spent a lot of time making making the you know the, the physics of that working um so it came down to maybe the you know the last few out like the last eight hours i want to say um and then i was like okay um i'll put in 
I'll put in the uh, 10 second mechanic. And then I was just horrified as, you know, I like to adhere to the theme. Uh, I think usually the theme allows you, allows for more creativity because you're kind of, uh, I think, I think um, minds tend to, to work better when you, you know, when, you, when, when it's like an open-ended canvas and you can just do anything you want, I think it's like a little bit hard, harder to actually harder to be creative than when you have some kind of limitation and you're trying to working around that limitation. I think you can often get more creative. And that's why that's one of the reasons I love Game Jam. Did I love this theme in the end? I, I kind of, this was the worst theme I, I, of a Game Jam I've ever partaken in. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's because it's like really specific or maybe it was my fault that I couldn't work around it. But I do know that I was all set up to, uh, do a, a Ludum Dare kind of recently. And then when they announced, the, I was like, okay, I had a whole weekend set aside and then they announced the theme and it was 10 seconds again. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I, I guess other people didn't feel the same way about it and they voted for it again. Um, I'm just like, I'm out, not not doing not doing Ludum Dare this weekend. So yes, I put in, I put in the mechanic where the construction worker has to um, eat at a station every 10 seconds and it made the game like the pacing was all off. It made the game so much worse. Uh, uh, and yeah, I had to stick to the theme. So I, I kind of fudged it. I made it so that the construction worker starts. Now, mind, mind you, this whole time, this is this is a human construction worker character. OK. Um, the construction worker at 10 seconds starts sweating and like and like starts like look and and, and I think it's like a, a, a speech bubble like I'm so hungry, or I need a lunch break, or something like that. The game was called I Need a Lunch Break. And uh, and then, so I fudged it a little bit. I think I, I was able to kind of like, at 10 seconds is when the, the construction worker gets hungry. And then you have like maybe five more seconds to get, get to a, a lunch station. Still didn't feel great. So, so um, yeah, I submitted, I submitted that, that uh, game jam. Um, as is, uh, I didn't have time to do one of the key things I wanted to do with the mechanic because I, I didn't have time to iterate on the game because I was so kind of, um, fixated on this whole 10 second thing and making that work right. In addition to that, I was really like mired in kind of like the physics programming. I'm, um, so yes, uh, that, that game turned out a little bit less than I was hoping just in terms of like what I, yeah, I, I wasn't completely satisfied with it by the end. Um, fast forward, I think, in, I think it was, yeah, maybe middle of 2020. Uh, I, 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 I was just kind of going over some of my, like my old games and I was like, Oh, I can revisit this, this game jam, which, I, I, uh, I don't, you know, I had these problems with it and, I, and so I'm like, okay, I can revisit it so that I took out the, I took out the 10 second timer. I'm like, this is, this is really bad. And the other thing I did was, so in, in the Ludum Dare game, you kind of have these blueprints of these structures you had to build, which are just, uh, they're just kind of like a template of, uh, these these um, blueprint blocks kind of kind of like uh, you, oh you had to build it in the shape of a square or you had to build it in like a pyramid. Um, however, in that game, you could you could leave blocks outside of the blueprint. So so imagine you had to make that pyramid. You could just make the whole square. Um, you could fill that whole square with blocks, and that would still be acceptable. And I mm -hmm. and I and I remember I thought like a little bit after the jam was was like oh. Uh, it'd be an, it could be very interesting that if you had to map it exactly, because uh, I think that yeah, I think that could lead to kind of potentially some some uh, more interesting gameplay. So that was the other thing I did. I kind of I kind of input I implemented that logic to kind of say that if you had blocks outside of the blueprint structure, the structure um, it would you know you wouldn't be able to pass the level. So I just tried that out, and then I, I I made a random blueprint generator that kind of would make these random structures, and uh, and and then yeah, I was pretty happy with that. I was it turned out to be kind of like a fun little you know little mechanic. Uh, so I left it at that. Um, then <laughs> then 
I had a conversation with uh, my friend Andy Hull, who, as you know, is is one of the one of the two main people working on this game, and uh, he was he was just kind of we were just catching up. We kind of talked to him a little bit, and he was telling me that he uh, he was feeling a little burnt out after his last project, and he you know he didn't know if he he was just like I don't know if you know I don't know if like I'm not, I don't think I. Uh, I, I don't know if I want to make another game for for a while, um, and this was like, oh shoot, um, this this is bad. Uh, so I I just kind of said, Andy, I know you were burnt out from working on your last game because it, it was it was kind it was a lot of it was like a solo project. He kind of had mm-hmm. shoulder all the burden um, on, on 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 himself, and I just asked him, what if it was. What if you worked on another game? Because I'd 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 wanted to work with Andy for a while, so I just put put it out there. I'm like, do you want to? You know, what if you worked with someone else? Would would you would you still feel that way? And he was he just said, yeah, potentially. I I I think that would like if someone else was in charge of the design at, at least. I think um, that would just like relieve a lot of the the pressure and stress. And I could I think I could I think I could potentially enjoy working on a game again. So I, so I suggested. I was like, okay, well, do you want to work on a game together? And then Andy says, um, "Yeah, but George, I don't want to ruin our I don't want to ruin our friendship because we've we've both seen cases where some friends will work on a game together, like the, especially these indie indie <coughs> game projects with small teams, and you're kind of interfacing with them all the time. And then um, we've seen cases where people start off a project as friends, and then they." They don't talk after they like finish the project and they don't talk anymore. And uh, so I countered with Andy, let's make the let's let's make the smallest game possible in three months, okay? Because three months is is not enough time to ruin a friendship. That's about my <laughs> counter offer. <laughs> so he 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 had to accept my my sound logic, <laughs> and, and and he 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 agreed to work on something. So. We, we were like, okay, we have something we want to do in three months. So I went through all my Ludum Dares, and and uh, I, I, I picked out maybe five of the ones I thought could lead to a three-month project that were small enough in scope that we could actually do something in three months. And I, sh- I was like, Andy, because I, I, I wanted him to enjoy you know what we were working on. So I, I was like, I, I'm okay working on with any of these five. Why don't you play all these and t- tell me which of these you're most excited to work on? And and the construction, the the, the revised construction worker game was what Andy chose. So that so was. So how that, did that you come moment. up with the uh, the wombat? Like how did that how did that uh, animal get in there? Yeah, that 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 actually took place. So Andy chose the the construction worker game uh, yeah. prototype, and it was still a human at this point. And so when we started working on this game, it was still going to be your your human construction worker. And uh, I think I was just it was it was a few things. So I feel like I learned about this wombat fact way too late in life. I think I learned it maybe only four four or five years ago. Um, that's still many too many years of my life without knowing this incredible fact. I, I like I like animals a lot. I I watch nature nature documentaries. No nature documentary has told me this fact. They, they all failed me completely. Like uh, I know a lot of random facts about animals. Um, I didn't know this one, so I remember when learning about it. I was like, "Holy cow! There's an actual animal in the world that poops cubes. It's like unbelievable." Uh, I think maybe earlier that year, I was also listening to a podcast talking about like the just had a, like a short podcast um shout out to S- stuff you should know that's, that's a really awesome podcast um and they were talking about wombats for like it was a, it was like a short episode about wombats and, and 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 they went into like their their poo and then was like saying how they're saying like how wombats are so cute that for 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 years scientists didn't want to like they couldn't they couldn't bring it to themselves to dissect one to like oh. to find out what exactly was happening in there and 
they lucked out because they found one that got hit by a car and the what? car, you know, it was like, you know, and so they're like, okay, we're sad for the, for the wombat that got hit by a car, but now we can, you know, dice, dice, dissect it. Oh, like, like see what's going on in there with like, you know, without like, you know, ruining our conscience or yeah. Uh, so they, yeah, they found out that, uh, the insides of a wombat's intestines near the end, they had like different levels of elasticity. So uh, that that's kind of what like, you know, pushes it out as a, as a, as a, as a like a square shape. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the dryness of it is what breaks it into like the, the individual cubes, like the, it's kind of like the same way rabbit pellets work. I'm, I'm talking a lot about, animal poop right now <laughs> no no i mean I think that so we, we might have the title for our uh, podcast why do wombats poop cubes <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's that that sounds like yes that's an excellent title so That'll bring viewers running the road. <laughs> straight from the hills so i was i was amused by all of this just you know beyond beyond all you know everything and I think so. It was it was it was in my mind at the time, and then I I don't know. I think I was just on like a walk one day, and I and I was like, wait, we're making a game about a construction worker who stacks blocks. Can we? <laughs> and there's this fact that I really think, you know, if if the world failed me, if all the nature documents just failed me, I could make a game about this, and help spread the word about this wonderful fact. Right? I, I could I could. Make a game about the fact that wombats poop cubes, and then thus more people in the world would know that wombat poops cubes. That's one of the secret purposes of this game, by the way. Um, so, so, but but still, I was like, okay, this is just an idea. Can can we make this work? So I was like, you know, the, our my next call with Andy, I was like, Andy, Andy, <laughs> I have this, I have this, I have this idea. Um, Let's see if we could do it. So, so we were a little bit skeptical at first. We we're like, okay, what, that has to fit. And then we just tried it out, and it it just it fit perfectly. It just works. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, from that day on, it was you were a construction worker wombat, and instead of stacking metal blocks that you know, like girder girderish blocks, uh, you would just stack. You would just poop out blocks and stack those. Uh, and just and, for the record, George, are you and Andy still speaking? Oh yeah, we're still. We're, uh, <laughs> yeah, we actually worked on the game for much longer than three months, and I would say we're we're still friends. We're better friends now than when we started the project. So that's wow. some good news, right? <laughs> Greatness. So a team of friends in All Yes Good, first game is Hard Hat Wombat. What sort of happiness or what sort of vibe can we expect from All Yes Good games uh, from here on in? Because Hard Hat Wombat sounds humorous, sounds fun. I myself want to play it. And uh, hopefully it's more games like that. It's just pick it up and it's wacky. Yeah, so All Yes Good vibes. What are What is an All Yes Good game? Uh, I'm always happy when the theme is a little, a little, uh, just makes you go like, what? I haven't played a game with that theme or it kind of makes you take, yeah, take notice like plants. I've not seen a game with plants fighting zombies. Like that's weird. I want, I kind of want to check that out. It seems like an odd combo, but yet it kind of works somehow. Uh, I, wow. There's a game where, uh, octopus watches like basically a YouTube video of, of, of a, of an octopus, you know, getting cut up to be made into sushi, and he he goes full rage mode, and you know him being like a kaiju-sized octopus, he just like trashes everything, <laughs> trashes like oh, yeah. the mission. Yeah, you that you are the world destroyer sense. because of yeah. Um, and then now, yes, this 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 wonderful nature fact brought into oh, it, like that that makes this. Wombat in particular, very good at his occupation, which is to build, you know, houses that are made of cubicle poop. Um, so I'm always happy when uh, the the you know my games kind of have a uh, kind of a, a theme that stands out. I was having dinner with with a friend of mine. He's he's like, George, you don't 
I, I'm like a pretty, you know, straight edge person in, in life. And he's like, George, you don't do drugs, but all your games feel like feel like they're themed. Like you just took some drugs and then you came you came up with these ideas. Well, um, you could you yeah. could say the same about Shigeru Miyamoto as well. Who, yeah, who, I, I don't. Yeah, think that was, uh, right. You, you eat, right. You eat these mushrooms. <laughs> in, and then, yeah. 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 So yeah, that's Shigeru I, Miyamoto. Wow. Yep. <laughs> you, you, and, you and Shiggy uh, yeah. are the same mind. Well, I think that, um, like that makes, yeah. I mean, that sentence right there. I like <laughs> if there's one person I want to meet in this world, it's Shigeru Miyamoto. Like that's my that's like bucket list material for me. That's like yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Shout out to anyone I'll, listening if you can hook that up in any way. <laughs> Well, ask Reggie. Um, Reggie, yeah. Reggie. Reggie works with us, and we'll ask Reggie. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if he can hook, just hook make, that up. make the rest of my life pretty much. Um, wow. Yeah. 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 It, it really, it, it, it's really yeah at that level. Uh, I mean, he's a, he's a great guy. He tells good stories. The one one story he told me is that he was a member of the Scouts in uh, as a as a young boy in uh, in Japan, and he remembered. Uh, uh, how they used to go on, on on field trips and he went on this one field trip through a forest and then he got to the top uh, through the trees and saw this lake and that later became the inspiration for uh, for all the for the Zelda games the legend of Zelda That's so, so uh, yeah yeah so yeah he's he's a, he's, a, he's a cool guy um, George when when is the game out what platform is it out for and uh, 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 you know, we can we can we can end on those 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 facts. Yeah, the game is coming out in less than a week on October twenty fourth. That's my brother's birthday, but also that's that's kind of why I chose it. But then after I chose it, I realized October twenty fourth, ten twenty four, is a square number. <laughs> I was pretty oh. toyed. Because <laughs> on Octagon, we were trying to make everything line up with the number eight. And I was like, are we going to do this again? I don't know. We were kind of like, we did, we kind of went overkill on that. Anyways, it's coming out on October 24th. It's going to be on on Steam, your, on PC. And yes, was was there a third part of it? I, yeah. No, well, we'll check out the, the great new George uh, fan game and, and uh, on the 24th and, uh, you know, it's 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 not uh, zombies; it's wombats. But the cool thing about it is, wombats are cool for Halloween as well. So we're approaching; we are in that season. So so play uh, uh, hard hat wombat for Halloween, and maybe dress up as one too. Ooh, uh, yeah, dress up as a wombat. So <laughs> so uh, for for Oct really quick for Octagon, the launch day, I dressed up as an octopus, and I and I. I ran around angrily shouting her on the streets of San Francisco and I rolled, I rolled around, I rolled <laughs> down like down the street because you do a lot of rolling in, in, in enough to get in. And yeah. I am not going to dress up as a wombat and do similar things for this game. I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to, I'm just going to say it right here. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to dress up as a wombat and do what the wombat does. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that yeah, is if not you by George's house on Halloween. You might get a square tootsie roll. <laughs> yeah. You might, you might, you might. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll be there, man. We'll make the flight out just for that to see what's at the door. Um, George, fan, thanks so much for uh, taking the time. Garth, thanks so much as well. Uh, I'm, I'm Harold Goldberg. It's, it's Ronald Gordon asking questions as well. Um, Thank you so much for uh, uh, for watching this and, and come to the New York Game Awards in January. Thanks very much, guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks yes. for having us. Thanks for talking. Thanks.